Alrighty, let's, uh, let's get started. So, we've been talking about uh, a whole bunch of things. Um, I'm going to wrap up. May, this may not be the, the last subject, but uh, basically we're going to finish off with uh, going back to the beginning uh, with recursion. Um, and specifically today we're going to talk about data log, which is uh, another form of, of query language. So we've talked about relational algebra, we've talked about um, we've talked about SQL. Data log is basically another entry into that list, and in particular, it's one that's designed uh, specifically to make recursion uh, and recursive queries easier to express. Uh, we'll see what kind of problems that incurs, and we'll see how those problems can be addressed. Uh, before that, a uh, quick um, one thing I wasn't able to cover on Wednesday. Uh, we were talking about uh, how functional dependencies uh, and normal forms interacted, and in particular noticed that uh, the third normal form uh, was sufficiently general that you could decompose it uh, you could decompose anything into something that satisfies third normal form, uh, but we couldn't enforce, uh, we couldn't, uh, third normal form may still not necessarily uh, support every single functional dependency. And so one thing that we can do, actually let me give you an example of that. Uh, let's say you have a relation ABC uh, with a key AB. Um, and that key has the functional dependencies a, b goes to c, and b goes to c. Um, so recall our, our rule was that either the uh, left-hand side is a, uh, for, for <coughs> recall that for, um, what should we call it? Uh, recall that for a three normal form, there are basically two conditions that, uh, that could possibly hold uh, for non-trivial functional dependencies. So either the right-hand side has to be a subset of a key, or the left-hand side has to be a superset of a key. And in this case, the one key that holds on this relation is AB. So the first, uh, the first functional dependency is satisfied, uh, but the second one isn't. Um, one way to think of this is that you actually have uh, basically two attributes, A and B. Neither of them are keys for the, uh, neither of them are independently uh, keys for the relation, and then we have this extra attribute C that's tacked on. Now, no matter how we we could potentially decompose this into A B and B C, uh, but then we wouldn't have a way of enforcing uh, the constraint uh, A B goes to C. That entire thing would have to be on a single relation. Uh, on the other hand, if we have A B goes to C and B goes to C, there's a little bit of redundant information there. Uh, because in, in the functional dependencies themselves. Um, if A, B goes to C and B goes to C, then that A there is, is pretty much redundant. Even if we don't have the A, we can still uh, figure out what C is. And so this leads us to this idea of the, the minimal cover uh, for a set of functional dependencies. Um, so basically, a, a minimal cover satisfies, uh, is a set of functional dependencies re uh, that relative to some original set, F, uh, the minimal cover, we're going to call that G, satisfies a couple of properties. Uh, so first off, the closure of the two had better be the same. So anything that you, any kind of functional dependency that you can incur, uh, in, infer uh, from F, you can also infer from G. So basically, you're not losing any information. G. Uh, G might have, have fewer functional dependencies in them, in it, or simpler functional dependencies, uh, but you're not losing any information by using just those. Uh, the second property is that the right-hand side had better be uh, exactly one attribute. So regardless of how many uh, attributes are on the left-hand side, there will be exactly one on the right-hand side. And finally, uh, the, the sort of minimality property is that any any functional dependency that we delete from G uh, must result in some, some change in, in its closure, uh, basically must, must bring it away from the closure of F. So uh, basically whatever, uh, whatever this, this is a precisely the set 
of, of, um, of single attribute right hand, on the right hand side uh, functional dependencies that can be used to express the closure of that. Let me give you an so, example. Yes? So what is the uh, implication of second point of the previous one? Uh, what is the implication of this? Um, we will come, uh, I'll get to that in actually, well, uh, okay, so in this particular example, um, what is the, uh, the implication of that is that you can always create a relation containing all of the attributes in that functional dependency. And the left hand side will always be a super key, it will always be a key for that relation, and the right hand side will always be a dependent attribute. Uh, but you, you, won't end, you won't have uh, sort of partial uh, partial mappings from, from key to attribute. Does that kind of make sense? So if we, if we don't have we give C here, then we would require having two so, attributes of the reference here. So in both cases, okay, uh, I guess the, it's, it's actually connected a little bit to the, the minimality constraint. Uh, so for it, it uh, isn't illustrated here, uh, but let's say we had another attribute So let's say we had a uh, relation A, B, C, D. Again, A, B is a key. Uh, we have those functional dependencies, and then we also have A, B goes to D. Uh, a, B goes to C, D. Um, you, can de you can actually take this functional dependency and decompose it into two parts. So it, in, in practical terms, uh, so we talked about union and, and decomposition of functional dependencies. Uh, in practical terms, this is entirely equivalent to A, B maps to C. Uh, sorry, C depends on A, B, and uh, D depends on A, B. So the, this is equivalent to these two together. Um, but decompo but uh, decomposing them like this uh, makes it quite a bit easier to reason about them. Uh, so in particular, uh, in this case, A, B maps to C, D. Uh, the only way that we can satisfy this, uh, this functional dependency is if we have uh, the relation A, B, C, D. And that uh, violates third normal form. But if we split it up into these, these two, um, then we have A, B goes to C, which we can, well, I'll show you how, but basically we can sort of reduce this this is, this is redundant because we already have B goes to C. This we hold on to, and so we end up getting a relation A, B, D, and another relation uh, B, C. And neither of these violate third, third normal form. Because we have A, B goes to D, A, B is a superset of the key, and B, C, uh, goes to, we don't have that one anymore, so uh, it's just the B uh, satisfies the function of the MC. Okay, uh, let me give you a, a quick example of this. Uh, we have a couple of functional dependencies, uh, so the top ones are uh, the original set, and this is, uh, I, this is basically the minimal cover for that set. And to demonstrate that it is the minimal cover, so A goes to B, wait, obviously gives you A goes to B. Um, you can infer A, B, C, D goes to E from A goes to B. So that gives you uh, these two. And A, C, D goes to E. So basically by combining these two, you can get uh, A, B, C, D goes to E. Um, another, another way of looking at it is uh, uh, add a, add C D to here. That gives you A goes to A C D B. Add E here. Uh, add B to both sides here. A C D uh, goes to E B. 
no, ACDB goes to EB, and then you can get ABCD uh, goes to EB and split that apart into ACD goes to E. Um, EF goes to G, you can combine that with EF goes to H, uh, into EF goes to GH, uh, standard union there. And ABCDF uh, goes to EG, you can infer from uh, from uh, ACD goes to E and EF goes to H uh, by adding F to both sides here uh, and you get, oh, sorry, that should be EF goes to G. Um, okay. uh, and there's actually a very simple algorithm that you can, get, you can use to uh, get the minimal cover for a set of functional dependencies. Uh, so basically three steps. Uh, first off, using decomposition, you can get, uh, you can satisfy the set second predicate, um, or the second condition. Uh, basically, take every single functional dependency and split it off into uh, individual uh, terms with only uh, one attribute on the right hand side. Uh, second step, um, you can uh, you can sort of iterate over each of these and just remove attributes. Uh, until you lose something from the uh, from the, the closure, um, and basically the way to do that is uh, if you have anything else that can infer um, yeah. um, delete an attribute, then see if AB maps to C is still in the closure. If it is, you're good. And finally, uh, repeat the process, deleting entire, uh, entire functional dependencies. So some functional dependencies may no longer be relevant. And if you do that, uh, you can uh, basically, these three steps, you'll end up with a minimal cover. Any questions on this? All right, so now we can move on to what we can move on to. Data log. So, uh, what is data log? Why is it useful? And if you're never actually going to use data log, uh, where, where will this help you? Um, so let me start off by giving you an example of something that using the SQL that we've discussed up to this point, you cannot actually do. You have a table with officers, the officer's direct superior, and the officer's rank. Now, how would you phrase the query, uh, who can Spock give orders to? Where any subordinate, uh, any subordinate either direct or indirect, um, could, be, uh, could receive orders from Spock? So who can, who can Spock give orders to directly? Sue, okay. But Spock can Spock also give or Spock can also give orders to Chekhov. And yes, I, I realize I'm butchering Star Trek a little bit here. But um, the the basic idea is is how would you phrase this as a SQL query? Could you phrase it as a SQL query? Or what might be a better question? All right. Well, uh, let me let me save you the the insanity. Uh, using SQL that we've discussed up to this point, this query this is actually impossible in general. Um, the the one thing you could do potentially is do a two way join. So you could forget, uh, for example, join officers against uh, their direct superiors, and you could find everyone uh, every single officer who. Uh, you can find every single officer and their direct as well as their indirect uh, superior. So they're, they're two levels up superior, so to speak. But that only gets you the two levels up superior. Um, you'd, if you had a three level hierarchy, you'd then have to do a three way join. But again, you're still restricted to three way joins. What you want is some way of actually recurring over this, uh, over this, this path. And uh, 
SQL 92, which is what we've been mostly working with so far, uh, doesn't actually support this. Uh, SQL 99 adds uh, something called with recursive, and we're going to talk a little bit about that uh, today. And basically, what you can you you can think of this as sort of the transitive closure of a view, a view defined in terms of its own tuples, and that leads to a whole bunch of problems uh, that we need to be able to understand how the database addresses because with recursive has some very very strict limitations and if you ever use that you you'll need to know what those limitations are and why they're there more importantly why they're there um, now because SQL tends to be a bit verbose um, and because you might actually encounter it uh, data log is becoming progressively more uh, relevant especially in, in uh, sort of graph, graph queries. Um, I'm going to give these examples in terms of a language called uh, Datalog. Um, Datalog is equivalent to SQL with the with recursive clause, and I'll, I'll show you that mapping uh, momentarily. But just to give you a sense of, of how Datalog looks like, um, it's a sequence of, uh, of statements of this form. And break it down, uh, a data log program consists of a sequence of what are called rules. And each rule uh, consists of a head and a body, and they're joined by this uh, colon equals sign. Uh, the body is further subdivided into individual atoms. And the way you can read this, uh, color-coded, uh, not super readable, but uh, the, the way you can read, uh, interpret this is that is as sort of an if-then statement. So if there exists an officer with attributes O, S, and R, then there must also exist a subordinate with attributes S and O. And similarly here, if there is uh, the, the comma, you can interpret as an and. So if there is an officer with attributes O, D, S, and R, and a subordinate with attributes ds and s, then there must be a subordinate with attributes s and o. Or more precisely, uh, for every officer tuple, you generate one, uh, one subordinate tuple. And for every, uh, everything in the join of the, the subordinate relation and the officer relation, you generate a new subordinate tuple. Is that clear? Any questions on this? Okay. So essentially, each of these rules is, is sort of a template uh, for, for inferring new tuples. And uh, this is also sometimes uh, known as deducing new tuples. You can make a, a de deduction that a certain tuple must exist. And so these, these data log based systems are often called uh, deductive databases. And as I said before, uh, this, there's an equivalent. Uh, the equivalent to this is the, the with recursive clause. So the way this would actually look in SQL is, uh, so you have a with recursive, and then you define a table, or a view, sort of. That view has uh, attributes, and it's defined essentially the same way you define a view. Uh, the only difference is that this view definition um, can refer to itself. So in this case, uh, there's actually direct correspondence between these rules and the rules that, uh, from the data log program. So this corresponds to the first rule, where we create one subordinate for every officer tuple. And uh, this uh, clause in the union uh, refers to the, the second rule, uh, where we compute the transitive closure. Uh, again, any questions on so then you can also do uh, more interesting things on top of this, and I'll show you move this back into data log. Uh, so if you want to, for example, find all of the subordinates of Spock, um, you could then just add a where clause to this statement. So this would basically return uh, Spock, or sorry, all of uh, the O column, uh, which is the, uh, the subordinate officer uh, for every Reveals the sign. Reveals. Uh, this one or? No. So, the, so what the equal officer OTSR to the OSR? What OTSR? Uh, 
so this is the direct superior of the officer, and this is the... Sorry, this should be reversed. Uh, direct superior subordinate is S. Uh, ah, yeah, you're right. So if, uh, no, th 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 these should be reversed. If, um, if an officer's direct superior is, oh, or flip, sorry, flip those. Uh, if an officer's, if an officer's direct superior uh, is the direct superior of Officer S, then um, no, these should these should be reversed. Sorry. Fix this. hopefully be a little more. Uh, so if uh, if the subpoena no, I got this in further backwards. There we go. That hopefully makes more sense. Uh, okay, so if If officer, if if officer is the so we we have an entity direct superior uh, su uh, direct superior officer and officer is a subordinate of direct superior and we also know that direct superior's superior officer. Uh, is uh, sorry, direct superior. Uh, <laughs> too many superiors. Uh, okay. Visual representation. <laughs> so we know that uh, officer <laughs> Spock Kirk. We have Officer uh, Sulu, whose superior is Spock. And from this, so we, we, we can infer from this that Spock has a subordinate Sulu, and that, well, let's add Chekhov. So we have Spock uh, has a subordinate Sulu. We have Sulu has a subordinate Chekhov. And we, uh, so that according to that last rule, we have uh, Spock has, uh, yeah, Spock has Sulu as a subordinate. And we have Sulu uh, has Check, or Chekhov has Sulu as a superior officer, we can combine those two uh, to get Spock as Chekhov as a subordinate. The ordering probably could have been better. I apologize. <coughs> Essentially what this is doing is just computing the transitive closure. If you have uh, two hot, if you know that, um, quick show of hands, who's familiar with Dijkstra's algorithm? or depth for, uh, breadth first search. This is basically doing breadth first search on um, all of these links. So basically if we have a link from, from Spock to anyone and we have uh, a, 
an officer relation that tells us that, that, that someone has a subordinate, Bob, uh, then we have, we, we now learn uh, a link from Spock to Bob. Reachability is another way of phrasing it. Okay, uh, so basically what we're, uh, what we like to do is be able to evaluate these queries. Uh, and, and not just uh, on the blackboard. Um, we'd like uh, an algorithm for, for evaluating these data log expressions. And when I, something to keep in mind again is that when I say uh, we want to evaluate data log expressions, uh, we will also want to, uh, basically the same algorithm would be used to evaluate recursive SQL queries. So, um, basically this, uh, I apologize for getting all existentialist, but basically the, the question then, uh, in order to uh, n decide how to evaluate a data log expression, we need to first have a concrete definition of what exactly uh, a data log program means. We need some semantics uh, for, for the data log uh, expression. And so there are two ways of describing the semantics of, of a data log expression, uh, one called least model and one called least fixed point. Um, so we'll quickly go over those. So um, a data log expression loosely, uh, as I said, is, is this if condition, if then clause. Um, if, if the body of, the, uh, of any given rule is true, um, then the head must also be true. If there is a tuple present, uh, if there are tuples uh, present that satisfy the condition set, uh, set out in the body, then we must also have a tuple uh, in the head. And I'm going to use this, this sort of uh, fuzzy distinction between truth, uh, truth and, um, and pr the presence of a tuple. Um, I'm going to sort of alternate between these two definitions because really they're, they're the same thing. Um, you can think of a relation as a condition. Uh, so given a particular uh, set of uh, values for all of the attributes in the relation, you can, you can phrase that as a Boolean, uh, a Boolean query. Is there a tuple with these attribute values? And you can do that just as easily as you can, uh, as you can ask for all of, the, uh, all of the tuples that satisfy uh, the, some predicate. Um, now, this, this particular definition, um, if the body is true, the head must also be true, is, is sort of unidirectional. Um, this is an if and not an if and only if. In other words, we can, uh, it, it forces uh, the creation of the existence of, of, of tuples defined by the head, uh, but it doesn't actually limit, uh, it doesn't actually preclude tuples from being present in the head. So here's a naive solution. Um, we, we put every single possible tuple into the head. Well, great. Uh, now that satisfies the, that'll satisfy any uh, data log program because the, the head columns have every single, single possible tuple that they could possibly have. Um, but in terms of practicality, this, this doesn't actually help us. So, uh, what we need is some way of defining uh, what a minimal solution to the program is. Uh, we need basically the, the minimal uh, set of attributes that satisfy this particular condition. So uh, I'm going to define a term, the model. Uh, a model is a, a set of relation instances that satisfy a data log program. So basically I give you a model, that is to say a set of relation instances, and then and a data log program, and you can tell me whether uh, that data log program's conditions are all satisfied. And um, yeah, so basically, the, the every single rule had better be satisfied for every single possible assignment of values to every single variable in the program. Now, a model can be bigger than than necessary. So this is this is sort of uh, since uh, a, a model is any set of relation instances that satisfies the predicate. A least model, on the other hand, 
uh, is a model that is uh, contained in. So it basically, for every instance, uh, it, for every instance in the model, the least model is the one that has the fewest tuples. Let me give you a, uh, this in terms of, of an example. Um, so. If we had, a res uh, we had our, our program there where we compute all of the uh, subordinates of a given officer, um, what would happen if we added Scotty Chekhov to the result set? So is, is there any rule that says Scotty Chekhov can't be in the result? Or if, if we had a, a result that included, uh, if we had a model that included the tuple Scotty Chekhov uh, in the subordinate table, that wouldn't actually be uh, excluded, even though Scotty has no um, actual uh, connection, direct connection to Chekhov. On the other hand, a model that included this tuple wouldn't be minimal since we could remove it without actually violating any of the constraints set forth by the, the data log program. Uh, so what we're looking for when we evaluate a data log program is this least model. Okay, um, that's one phrasing of, of this idea. The other one is known as fixed point. Uh, quick show of hands, who's taken uh, enough PL to know what a fixed point is? Okay, a couple of people. Great, good. So let's say you have a function. Very simple function. It can do whatever it wants, but it takes a, the, the only constraints are that it takes a value as an input and it produces a value of the same type as output. Now, one thing I could do with that function is call it on its own output. So I have f of x, that produces some value. I can call f of f of x. I could keep doing that. I can call f of f of f of x and keep going as many times as I want. I can basically just keep calling f on the same function over and over again. Uh, for example, I could add 1. And a fixed point is basically what happens when you just keep doing this up to infinity. Uh, depending on how the function is defined, uh, eventually you'll get to some, in, uh, to some input or some number of invocations of f uh, such that calling f on that value more times doesn't change it. Uh, one example would be what happens when you, uh, for any floating point number, uh, divide, let's say that I'm going to define f as divide by 2. Divide by 2. So I give you any number. We'll start with 4, for example. What happens when you divide by 2? Two? 2. 2. Then keep going. 2, 1. And eventually you'll get to 0. Yep. So 0 is, is conceptually the fixed point of the 1 half operation, or the 1 half function. Here's another one. Uh, let's say I have a function called double, and it takes a set of integers as input. And it produces as, as output the union of the original set and the set containing every single item in, in the original set multiplied by 2. So for example, if I had, I called double on the set 1, 2, and 5, I'd get 1, 2, 5, union, 2, uh, union, 1 times 2, 2 times 2, 5 times 2 which would be 1, 2, 4, 5, 10. So uh, what, uh, what, is, what is a fixed point of double? Let's say we started off with only even numbers. In fact, let's say we started off with 2, just the input 2. What would, what would the fixed point that we reach be? The set of all even numbers, exactly. Um, would the set of all integers be a reasonable fixed point? Well, what if we started with the set of all integers as input? The set of okay. So keep in mind this uh, this this notion works 
in, in a sense, it, it, ha it has to incorporate some notion of infinity. So infinite sets are, are not entirely out of bounds. Uh, so the set of all integers is, uh, is another example of a set that fits in here. Um, what about, how, so we, we've defined two different uh, sets here, for, uh, two different fixed points uh, of, the, of this function. The set of all even integers and the set of all integers. Um, which one is, uh, you, you can, Now, we need, uh, we can, uh, yes? So the fixed point is x? Uh, no, the fixed point is what happens when you keep evaluating. Uh, the result of evaluating f uh, repeatedly um, on some x. Some x? Yeah. Fixed so you could, some x. Yes, so I've, I've given you, uh, so for example, for the, the double function, um, there's actually multiple fixed points. So, uh, for example, the set of all even numbers is a fixed point, and the set of all integers is also a fixed point, depending on where we start. Um, now, just like we defined this idea of a least model, we can also define some notion of a least fixed point. Um, but in order to do that, uh, I've been using sort of this generic idea of function arguments. Um, we need some way of, of comparing uh, different fixed points. So we're, for the, the, double, uh, the double function, we're using sets of integers. For the, uh, for the one half function, we were talking about just integers. We can, we can have some mechanism uh, for comparing different values. Uh, so for example, for sets, we might uh, talk about set containment. Uh, and in this case, the set of all <laughs> integers would be bigger uh, conceptually than the set of all even integers. The set of all the even integers has fewer elements. And if we have some way of comparing function arguments in, in this way, we have some ranking on the, the function arguments, uh, we can define least fixed point in, in terms of um, the fixed point value that is smaller than all other possible uh, fixed points. So what would the, the least fixed points uh, be of double? Uh, the set of fixed points for a function is defined over all possible inputs. So, uh, <coughs> Uh, there could be a set of fixed points, and any fixed point can be generated uh, given any... You might not even have a single fixed point. Uh, so identity, for example. Uh, the function that returns its input um, would have an infinite number of, uh, of fixed points, because whatever value gets fed in gets, uh, gets returned. Um, so, but for, for any possible x, what would the, the fixed point be of, of double? Do you think it's like negative one, but always end up being negative one? Uh, so if you started off with a set containing a negative number, what would you get as, as the fixed point? Let's say you started off with negative two. Negative two, which is good. Uh, not just two. Yes, you're right. So the set of all powers of two, of all negative. Well, there, sorry. Uh, there, there be one that if you start off with two, no, with minus, so, one. minus one. Um, if you start off with minus one, then you would end up with still powers of two, but negative powers of 2. Okay, so that's that's one thing. We have one uh, fixed point. Uh, what about... We have one fixed point. Um, is that the smallest fix, so fixed point based on number of elements? How do we define this? The smaller is the number and 
number of elements. Oh, so let's say set containment. So uh, the, yeah. So um, let's say uh, the sets two, three, four would be smaller than the sets uh, two, three, four, five. It's the least. Okay, so that would be negative one, negative two, negative uh, four, negative eight, negative. Okay, is there another fixed point? <laughs> the, yes. I was thinking smallest size. Their value, their smallest okay. size set would be the one you said. Okay. Yeah, actually, you're right. Um, okay. Well, there goes that argument. Um, Yes, so there, there is, I was, I was going to argue for the fact that double does not actually have a least fixed point. Um, but you make a good point. In this case, it does. That is the empty set uh, on which double is the identity. But it's, it's entirely possible that you don't end up with a least fixed point. Um, in fact, there might not even be a fixed point. Uh, so for example, what happens if you uh, talk about the increment by one function? Does that have, have a fixed point at all? Increment by one. Yeah, uh, it depends on whether you, yeah, so exactly. Infinity, uh, depending on whether or not you, you consider infinity to be a valid uh, value of its input, um, it either does or does not even have a fixed point. Okay, uh, so we can do something similar for data log. Uh, we can talk about the fixed point of a data log program. So let's say we have uh, our, our original program here. We can express that, uh, I'm going to re-express uh, re that equivalently as a relational algebra program. So commas, ands, you can also think of those as natural joins. So we have the second rule here, projecting it down to O and S and unioning it with uh, subordinates. And so we can define subordinate in terms of a relational algebra expression that also takes in uh, inputs. It takes in officer and subordinate as, as inputs. Think of this as sort of a, a big function. Uh, a big function that takes a set of relations in and produces a new relation as output. So you, th this actually leads to one possible way of evaluating these expressions. You run this, uh, run this query. That gives you a new value for subordinate. But that also changes the input to the function. Now, if, if I decide that the officer relation is fixed, so I'm never going to, uh, to change officer, which in this case is, is true, the only thing that's being changed is subordinate, um, then I can rephrase this in terms of a single argument function and compute its fixed point. So every time I evaluate this function, every time I uh, compute this relational algebra expression, I'm potentially adding new tuples to subordinate. I'm never actually removing tuples because uh, I'm unioning, unioning it with the original value of subordinate. But I could be adding new tuples and uh, so I can, once again, talk about this idea of a fixed point. So basically, repeatedly apply this, this function and uh, repeatedly decide whether or not the, that application has produced new tuples. If it has produced new tuples or if it has changed the, the output, repeat. And you basically just compute the fixed point. Um, now, does this always compute the least fixed point? Once again, we have to have some way of, of talking about uh, of, of relating the, the, side, the, the inputs. So what if we use set containment? No. Why? Ah, but in this case, uh, okay, good point. Um, is it in fact a very good point. Uh, okay, so what if we started with no tuples and subordinates? And that was, that was our, um, what if we talked about the fixed point relative to a starting point that, so we can talk about the fixed point relative to a certain starting point. 
And um, let's say that that starting point in this case is an empty subordinate relation. So we have no tuples whatsoever in subordinates. Would this compute the least fixed point? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, it's only adding the tuples that are relevant, and it's never adding any uh, tuples that are not relevant. Uh, by the way, the book has a bit of a bug when it describes uh, least fixed point. Um, ignore the diagram. Uh, okay. So we can add uh, a couple of other things. So, for example, um, any this doesn't necessarily just have to be a list of relations. We can also talk about uh, various other conditions. So again, remember, this is, this is an if-then clause. So if there is this tuple, and if it satisfies this predicate, then reduce this output. Interestingly enough, this actually means that these relations, uh, the, sorry, these, these inequalities, you can actually treat them as relations themselves. Uh, infinite relations, I might add, uh, so that you can, you can think of this as the, uh, the set of all possible values of R that are greater than or equal to 3. And this is a tuple, and then once again, this, this entire thing uh, becomes sort of a natural join. Now, what about this? Does anyone see a problem with, uh, with this particular query here? Exactly. So where, where does opinion come from? Well, um, it doesn't. Uh, and as a consequence of that, subordinates, this, um, for any value of, a, the, based on the, the, uh, the way we defined our, our evaluation strategy, based on, for any valuation of any of these variables, this, uh, must, uh, a tu the, the corresponding tuple must exist in the head, which means that for any possible opinion column, any possible value of the opinion column, there must be a corresponding subordinates uh, tuple, which basically means now the subordinates uh, relation has, now has an infinite number of rows. Or, well, it could have zero rows or an infinite number. Uh, we refer to this as uh, subordinates being unsafe. And in particular, uh, the variable opinion is unsafe, uh, or also this can be referred to as the variable is not range restricted. Um, so if, if a variable appears bound to a, a, a relation in the body, then that's what it means for it to be uh, range restricted because we only have a finite number of values that can satisfy that particular uh, condition. Now, interestingly, uh, if, if uh, a program is safe, then it's guaranteed to have a finite least model. And uh, furthermore, if the, the safe program, uh, we haven't talked about negation yet, and we'll probably do that on Monday, um, then, the, the, the least fixed point will actually be identical to its least model. So we can use either of these terms, either of these, these definitions interchangeably. So, uh, okay, um, before I let you out, I want to quickly preface something that we'll cover on Monday, um, just to get it into your brains and start thinking about it. Uh, let's say I have uh, two different relations, ham and stoic and I define them in terms of one another. So I can say an officer is a ham, see this page for definition, um, if they are not a stoic. And they're a, a stoic if they are not a ham. So uh, two questions that I will leave you with. Uh, first off, uh, is Spock a large ham or a the stoic? And similarly, is Kirk a large ham or a the stoic, and um, the answer is not. A, the answer to the first question is fairly obvious. The answer to the second question is not. Um, so I will leave you with that. Any questions? All right. Well, uh, see you Monday, and uh, thanks for surviving. <laughs>